Hi, everyone, and welcome back to another Dynamic Leader Conversation. So today I'm speaking with Hamish Thompson, who is a New Zealander from birth. Um, he has a successful CEO and regional president and global brand um, experience. He was the head of Mars Incorporated, uh, a senior marketing and sales lead for Reebok International, and he was an account executive in the London advertising scene. So a lot of experience with Hamish. I'm really excited um, for the conversation. He's a non-executive director of OzHelp, uh, which is one of Australia's leading mental health and suicide prevention foundations. And the purpose for today's conversation, he's also the author of the book, It's Not Always Right to Be Right. So welcome, Hamish. Thank you so much for joining us. Hey, Shelley. Nice to talk to you. So the topic of today's conversation is around driving change with self, with individuals, with teams and entire organisations. And in your book, you offer messages and practical steps and strategic frameworks that help to drive the change. And so today I really am excited to be drawing on your 30 plus years of experience um, in international leadership roles. Uh, I think the book is awesome. Um, It reads so easily. It's really fun. Um, I have a question for you. For someone who's seldom read past chapter three um, in thousands of leadership books, how hard was it to get past the writing um, past chapter three in your book? So that's a, it's a good question because, as you say, I um, I detest leadership books for texts, et cetera, that talk around theory but offer very little sort of substance and, and action as of such. And I think majority of textbooks and stuff, you get in and you're probably about 100 pages in and you think, gee, this is interesting, but have I actually got anything that I can take away and actually sort of work on? So um, I it was different, which I liked it. I started out life with in London advertising. That was a very poor, very average copywriter. With that, I quickly got moved on to account management. So I've always enjoyed that sort of writing aspect. It was different. It was new. It was exciting. I didn't find it as challenging as I thought. And I think the reason being is when you're genuinely quite authentic and sort of putting out the truth of what you've experienced, the insights, the mistakes, the warts and all, I think it actually came out reasonably sort of easily. Um, My wife reminds me every day, Shelley, she says, uh, you're definitely no Hemingway. So uh, I think it's an easy read. It's not a academic intellectual sort of front, but um, hopefully perspectives, bit of curiosity for others and hopefully beneficial for uh, aspiring and established leaders. Definitely. And, you know, even just reading the the back of the the book um there are some people who like to be right every single time and that really resonated and you say in their minds there is always a winner and there is always a loser deep down very few of us like these people Um, and yet often we work for them we work with them and perhaps we even identify as one of them Um, at times I've been that person Um, it's not uh, it does not make me proud Um, true success comes from humility compromise and um, connection and I thought that really at some up the book so well Um, but tell us about how you've identified as one and and how you moved out of that because assume you're not still the person who likes to be right every single time no and I think it um I'm not sure if it's experience or age or you actually get that knocked out of you but I think most sort of people when you start out you have a perception that to be successful you need to be right Um, and uh, I think most of us inherently, whether you're with a sales, marketing, supplier or whatever, we're reasonably competitive and driven people. A lot of us are very results oriented and action oriented. So that perception of wanting to get ahead to intellectually spar, to win those debates and dialogues uh, every single time, it almost was that's your right of passage to play. And I think it was sort of over time, I think most of us come to that sort of perception that If you do that, one, it's short term, Um, you may get the initial win. And I used to view transactions, business transactions as, have I come out on top? Have I been successful? Normally, is it a monetary value? And then after a while, you started to think, maybe my relationships are not as enduring, maybe they're not as mutual as possible. And what probably came to me is I started to realize that the big breakthrough, the big transformation and opportunities 
come if you have a real depth and a quality of relationship. And normally, a bit like my sort of sports days on sponsorship, it's phase two and phase three or years two and three where you really start to get your sort of breakthrough and opportunity. So um, I've definitely changed the way I look at those business transactions. I used to measure it on monetary. I demand from my teams now, you look at the depth and quality. Are they enduring? Um, and have you got that partnership for year two and three? The worst thing, to what I've found, higher up you go within leadership, often your worst leaders are the most opinionated ones. And those people below, they don't challenge, they don't uh, question, because um, why would they? And worst thing, they almost come to inertia, because there's no point in doing that. They, If they challenge or raise, um, they'll lose the debate. So uh, hopefully I've learned, um, yeah, time will tell. So what's the difference between you who've learnt and understand the value of the depth and the quality of relationships versus those who are sitting in those senior leader roles who don't get it and probably never will? What's the difference? Um, I personally think, and I know there's that big sort of topic and discussion and many books we can talk around sort of servant leadership. Um, I know I'm a bit as a leader now because I think of others ahead of myself. Um, I think of purpose-led initiatives, visions, missions ahead of individual-led ones. So I think the difference is for those around you, I think it provides them a greater purpose and a greater motivation or ambition to drive and uh, probably sort of put more effort, uh, more, more effort within. Um, I definitely think it unlocks potential within others because they see that there's caring and empathy um, beyond a boss simply looking at their own sort of personal or personal agenda. Um, so that, those are probably sort of the, the, the main reasons. But uh, I think in many cases, a lot of people sort of need to go through it and experience it themselves to see what is overall, what's the better outcome um, and eventually we all hopefully come to that same conclusion. If we could do it earlier within our career, and I think a lot of the young people coming through, we talked earlier around sort of the, the university sort of stage, um, I think they are more purposeful. They're a little bit uh, less sort of self-oriented as well, which is a good thing. So if you've got a, a leader um, in a senior role in an organisation that's sitting quite high up um, and we know that a lot of change filters or comes from the top and filters down, is how do we how do we change the thinking and the mindset of leaders at that senior executive level who are still needing to be right every single time? What's the What needs to happen? Do we need to wait for them all just to retire and leave the workforce and, and let the others come through? Probably take a while, wouldn't it? <laughs> uh, listen, I, I don't think there's one sort of golden answer on. So let me, uh, let me come into the, a few different perspectives. I think those at the top, when they start to realise and they're curious enough, and I sort of term it having an insatiable curiosity, when they start to sort of value others' opinions and when different perspectives, different ideas, different concepts that are new to them and new to their thinking, I think they get that very quickly. And those great leaders, once they understand that, they'll seek to understand before being understood. They'll step back. Um, they'll think less around actually going first within conversations. And automatically, instead of that concept of already always listening, They'll actually have an open mind to begin with. So I think the more that you can provide perspective, different way of thinking, challenge, et cetera, into senior leaders, I think it will open their minds up as well. I think the other thing is when you do provide content to a senior leader, if you can also provide context behind it as well, and a lot of people say it should be very business-oriented feedback directly into a senior leader. I think the best art of feedback is high facts, definitely, but high emotion. Talk as to why it matters. Talk around the impact that a leader is having. Um, and I think that actually makes a difference. And the other one which uh, I've always challenged my agencies directly on, if you're an agency partner, a senior leader doesn't need more yes people. There's nothing worse than that. Most of my <laughs> direct reports and leadership teams, it's very easy to be loved by your direct reports. If, uh, 
if they don't love you, they're the ones who are going to be impacted against that. But an agency partner is a perfect opportunity to have crucial conversations, tell them as it is. And I tell agency partners that corporations, senior leaders need to be told we're slow, we're boring, and we're dated. Um, and those who care and truly partnership can have those crucial conversations. There are some leaders probably never change, but uh, I think the majority hopefully should. It's so interesting. It's one of the one of the things I enjoy the most about coaching is um, being able to be the person that goes, I'm not going to tell you what you want to hear. Uh, I'm going to tell you what I'm seeing and what I'm observing and give some insight into where your blind spots might be um, and ultimately um, get them to recognise that they are part of the problem and, and that that's a little bit uncomfortable. Um, but it's that there's no... Um, vested interest I'm unbiased in my approach and I think I don't know about you but I think every senior leader needs an executive coach who can really hold the mirror up and go this is what I'm seeing yeah I think so and I think those blind spots it's um it is about an inner confidence if you're told things that you don't like at a stage within your career that you're believing you have to be perfect show no vulnerability um you can often sort of ignore those and come up with the five reasons as to why that, that may not be right. So I, I like that term in regard to blind spots. Um, I think there has to be sort of a, an inner confidence within that, that mm -hmm. it's actually okay to be uh, okay to be wrong, uh, to concede concession, but actually change direction going forward. So no, I agree entirely. Mm. And not giving up on some of the things that um, form their strengths, but being more aware of the context in which it's appropriate and the context in which it actually is a disservice to what you're trying to achieve um, and bring awareness around that. Are you finding, Shelley, in uh, a lot of those sort of execs that you coach that is that an easier method? to to put across at a younger stage within their career or an earlier stage in their career? Um, or are you seeing that ability to almost sort of untap that thought process of opening up and being a little bit more vulnerable? Um, you've seen it at all different levels in, the, in tenures? Yeah, I think um, so. I'm seeing it, it doesn't... It doesn't always depend on um, how long they've been in leadership or the level that they're in. I think sometimes it has to do with uh, their energy levels. You know, those that are burnt out and just go, I'm absolutely exhausted with this kind of life. And that can happen for a lot of different reasons through different stages, but that it causes them to go, I need to do something differently. And they're a little bit, they're more open and receptive um, to change. I definitely find the conversations at this more senior, more experienced levels a lot more challenging because they're used to the confrontational sides of conversations and they've got some really um, well-established behaviours that they demonstrate to protect themselves, to not answer questions, to deflect. And so you, you really need to be switched on and tapped into what's going on in the conversation. Where are they taking this is this an avoidance strategy or is this something that needs to be explored a little bit deeper? So I think the nature of the conversations definitely shifts with those that are more experienced. Um, but I think change needs to have, there needs to be a catalyst for it. Um, and I'm, I'm keen on your thoughts around that, that you know, a lot of times it, there has to be something that has happened or something that is coming that is causing enough, enough discomfort for them to be open and receptive to it. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting sort of to have those conversations. And I always say that you can have the most crucial, challenging conversations when people know you care. If you think around that within your own personal life, it's uh, those ones you trust implicitly and you respect and love. When conversations are had of a challenging nature, even though they hurt, a, you notice them and they're the ones that make the biggest impact. So I think on a, on a coaching front or also within the colleagues and relationships, when you have true care and empathy and are genuinely wanting to support and show blind spots uh, to, to another, you can have those conversations. Mm -hmm. I, I think the biggest unlocker is probably people, and I know it's banned and sort of everywhere, but uh, about being authentic. Um, I think most leaders come to a point in time when they realize 
this is bloody tiring being two different people, mm. one from work, one from home. So it's disingenuous in, in regard to one area. But secondly, it's incredibly hard to be your very best if you are not your very best in regard to a life perspective. And I think a lot of leaders start to realize, hey, I need to be the type of leader that I want to be, not the type of leader that I think others want me to be. And as soon as they get that right, that's when the personal satisfaction comes in. But equally, that's when the confidence comes in. Yeah. You know, and it's not so much around me. I'm actually here to, as a privilege to lead and to, uh, to do it with others. And I know that sounds very sort of highbrow and uh, almost sort of esoteric, but to be honest, that's when, in my experience, the productivity, the results, the breakthrough, the transformation can actually really happy when you're totally comfortable, you're making decision-making from a overall good perspective as opposed to, gee, okay, how do I look personally? And that's a bit of a shift from a few decades ago, even a decade ago, when, um, you know, work for work and home for home, leave the two separately. Um, it's, it's a big shift for people who've been in the workforce for a long time to actually trust that tapping into my authentic self and who I am is actually going to lead to success when in the past, actually, that's probably led to a little bit of a disadvantage. And I suppose the, the question is, is a little bit like you talk around sort of what's the catalyst for change. Historically, if you have been successful and if you have risen through the ranks following that style, um, there's probably isn't as much catalyst for change. There's always two ways in regard to that, to do that burning platform. Do you try and inspire people with vision and hope for the future, et cetera? Or do you shock them in regard to hell? or in a position of pain, there's a massive fire against that. I think inherently we know it should be vision and aspirational in regard to inspiring change. Uh, the fact of the matter is some people are inherently dissatisfied and you need to actually light that fire and that is the climate for change they actually follow. The other one which I've uh, found over time, um, when it's one or maybe even two people talking around a blind spot to you, um, at times it can almost be a little bit, well, okay, there's always sort of, I hear what you're saying, but here's a rationale as to why it's not. When it's a collective response that actually comes from, and a couple of your feedback frames will do this, but 360 through a wide variety of stakeholders, it actually it's a little bit sort of wake up call as well within that. And one of the best things that I've found uh, within leadership, when you get reverse mentoring from particularly somebody at a young age, and I'm a massive supporter of getting graduates into and apprentices mm. to sit down with CEOs, leadership teams, review plans for a start strategically because most of it's a little bit fluffing up in the air from our side. Um, so they simplify that and they decomplexify and actually make it really focused. But more so, they'll tell you as it is. And if they can do that in early age, I listen to somebody at the age sort of around 18 to 21, so sort of probably more so than those who are telling me what I want to hear at a very senior level. It can be quite confronting though, but uh, pretty, uh, pretty beneficial. We really have to change the way that we um, respond to, you know, you mentioned lighting the fire, is we need to shift or be more conscious and intentional about how we respond when a fire is lit in, you know, that, that automatic desire to pull back and, and shift away or smooth over and make everything right. Um, and so it's almost this counterintuitive thing where it's like you need to hold it and even stoke it and put more fuel on it. Yeah, and a lot of people, you will revert back when there's a tension or a pressure valve that's actually switched on immediately. Majority of people revert back to their default style. And if that is defensive, <laughs> reactive, et cetera, confrontational, that often happens. And I think the element is that, and again, I'm not sure if it's sort of experienced so, but sitting back and actually reflecting and truly trying to understand not just the content, but why that feedback or that input, what's the context behind it? Um, that's the bit I think on that. And I've always been one of these people that when I get asked something, I've always got an immediacy to the answer. Even if I don't know it, I'm thinking, okay, well, this is what I know. And I, well, I believe I know. The stepping back, reflecting more, 
I think all effective leaders know that there are very few things that actually need urgency within the moment. Um, you always believe they are, but the importance of it uh, allows you a little bit of perspective, curiosity to uh, sort of go through the different options. I remember I had a very good uh, friend who was at uh, Extrata, which was the, mag uh, the mining magnate. And every single option that was put into their leadership team had to be extremities on a four quadrant model. So that way they had massive perspective and curiosity around completely different thought processes. So anything within the middle that was a safe thing, uh, we can think about ourselves. We want extremities. Um, and I just love that because it challenges diversity of thought. And that's why you need diversity uh, of thinking, gender, culture within the leadership teams as well. Oh, it's such a good point. Actually, a conversation that I've had recently around um, making sure that you do have a really diverse group of um, people and where in some organisations or some teams they'll have an overrepresentation in one area or one style of approach uh, and an underrepresentation in the other. And I think because purely based on numbers, there's only one of you saying this and there's six of us saying something else that that one person is easily discounted. But I think remembering that that one person actually, actually represents, you know, probably, 50, you know, 25% of the population. And so while they might not have the numbers in the room, they represent a broader number in the community or in society or in business. And when you shut that down or discount it, you're actually closing the door to a whole lot of opportunities that sit more broadly around that, aren't you? Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a really good way of looking. That's why I, I love the sort of millennial committees or thought diversity committees. They come along and test your thinking, but actually directly mm -hmm. challenge. And I've set up these sort of external committees with totally different sort of thought processes from architects to public servants to graduates <laughs> to apprentices, et cetera. And you place a mixture in. And the brief in is challenge our thinking tell us we're crap where we need to, tell us where we're slow, boring, or, or dated on that. And it's not saying you actually accept, obviously, uh, their points of view as gospel, but it makes you sort of sit back and it actually makes you rethink, particularly around simplicity, particularly around focus. Um, are we doing the right things? Is it making a difference? And I think importantly, it actually makes you start changing before you need to change. And that's one of the concepts which um, I've got within the book, but I'm a massive believer. How do you stay ahead of that curve, fix before it's broken, um, and control your agenda and lead change before manage change? And I think the best way to do that is have people remind you consistently, gee, okay, hang on, you're not sort of uh, getting X, Y, and Z. And big multi-corporates, we have hundreds of different markets and people we talk to, we're incredibly insular. You know your way of thinking, your style, our personalities, our decision-making processes, um, and it can be very isolating in regard to perspective as well. When I think about all you've just said, I, I do wonder whether there is rarely opportunities for you to be, for it to be right for you to be right. Like in those situations, it's almost right to almost always be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Life would be chaotic, though, wouldn't it? I think I think on that. I, um, Shelley, there's one thing that uh, I've followed probably probably for around ten years now, and as I said, my personality is always wanting new and different, and I uh, annoy the hell out of the rest of my leadership team. So um, I term it uh, constant dissatisfaction. I've been told probably tech coaches like yourself things would tell me, no, it's got to be healthy dissatisfaction. But even when performance is going well and the status quo is working, I'm always wanting to do things differently. Now, the danger of that is you can lose focus on core revenue and core profits of sectors or territories. Um, but I've got a concept which I term a 30% rule. And you only take parts, small parts of your business but you will set a target and objective to your teams that the only way, it's a stretch target, the only way that can be achieved is through a completely different thought process, executional foundations and methodologies will have to be something completely new within that. 
and it forces people, A, to look externally, but to open it up completely. The danger is if you try and do that in too many parts of the business, uh, as opposed to just continuous improvement, uh, it's, uh, it's very chaotic. So I've learned to rein it in, um, but when you get those things, it just opens people's minds up as though, gee, okay, these three or 4% sort of growth targets, it is possible to actually get ahead of the curve and get your 20s, your 30s, et cetera, or in some of the scale-ups, obviously, uh, triple digits. Gosh, it really does highlight the need to be super aware of the environment, your intention, and the context at which you apply certain approaches to leadership, doesn't it? Spot on. It's, um, there's, no, there, there, there's no magical answer for it. And uh, I've always sort of thought that the different parts of a portfolio um, that you play, every, whether it's a brand, a segment, or a customer, um, they're all slightly different. And unfortunately, I think most people view the capabilities uh, as the same. So I'll give you an example, almost. And I think you've um, the one book that I did finish was uh, the Michael Watkins first ninety days. I, I lie, sorry, I got up to chapter six, I think, but that was good for me. Yeah. Um, but it talked around those four quadrants of uh, uh, stages of a business. I think startup, turnaround, realignment to maintain success. Now, to me, a maintaining success actually means decline. I've just always thought that as soon as you use that terminology, it reduces the pressure valve itself. But whereas a continuity, even though I've done that within my career reasonably successfully, it doesn't bring the energy out of me and the motivation. A realignment situation, hey, we're not quite as good as we think we are. We have to move and tack within this direction. Or a turnaround, we're in a world of pain, um, conviction sort of uh, fellowship. Those are the areas that excite me and I believe I'm reasonably capable within that. But on that continuity, yeah, I'm okay at it, but it's not really going to bring the best out of me or for the organization. So I think defining what those needs are with an organization, one size definitely doesn't fit all. And then um, knowing where you don't um, necessarily light up or align or you know do your best work is where you start to bring in your team and the people around you and really amplify the strengths of others. And, and that's really intentional as well. Yeah, definitely. It's, um, yeah, I know everyone sort of says you want to bring in people a lot better than yourself, but if you are a confident or in a confidence in regard to, uh, to leadership, um, you'll do that every day of the week. It makes your life so much better. It challenges you. It makes you think in different directions mm-hmm. as well. Um, I'm a big believer, and I've uh, talked around this a bit in regard to that concept of uh, drains and radiators. Um, and within a organization uh, or a uh, sort of personal life, you're always going to have drains and radiators around you. And a drain is obviously somebody who sort of sucks the lifeblood out of possibility, very limiting beliefs, etc. We've all got our drain moments. Um, but I think there's probably nothing worse than an organization when people have limiting beliefs around possibilities. And it radi- uh, sorry, it uh, infects on a negative basis right across an organization. So my recruitment philosophy is very much, even if they lack a little bit of uh, operational experience, how do you get in those people with positivity, possibility, um, infectious nature right across uh, the organization of a can do doesn't mean they're a Pollyanna you mm-hmm. still want them to challenge and provoke etc um, but you want to see possibility and my regret within my career probably three or four stages I should have moved a lot faster on drains within the business but I didn't because they were functionally and technically incredibly good but they weren't good integrators or connectors of others um so uh that's something i'm very conscious of now yeah. in personal life as well you, you can't sort of get pulled down too often agreed do you do you think that um a lot of the drain concept is created with this absolutistic thinking so if it's not this then it's that and if it's not that then it's it's two ends of an extreme so if it's not open then it must be closed and if it's not closed then it must be open as opposed to well maybe it's actually a jar and it's somewhere in between and so I think a lot of what I see is a lot of limitations are this need for absolute and this reluctance to move into almost a a sliding scale or 
working across a spectrum like a door being ajar and being okay with that yeah i've never actually uh, i've never actually thought of it like that but um i i, I get you entirely with and that's about that flexibility and everyone use the word sort of pivots now um i uh, i got exposed to that uh um, a concept called C plus W is greater than E. Curiosity plus willingness, and I term willingness, willingness and passion is greater than experience. And I think if you've got both that curiosity, insatiable curiosity and a willingness or a passion, I think you will be flexible. Yeah. Um, and often what you don't know can actually be beneficial. If you know too much, uh, and that's the danger of staying within one position for too long, mm -hmm. um, and I've had a lot of uh, team members sort of talk, oh, gee, okay, am I being a blocker with an organization because I've been here for too long? My view is as long as you are sanely curious and you've got a willingness and a passion to look at new perspectives, diversity, change, pivot, et cetera, um, no issues whatsoever. But the day you don't and you only know what you know and you're closed off on that, and mm -hmm. as you say, it's a black or a white as opposed to a gray, um, I think then it is, uh, it's probably a performance conversation issue. Yeah, and even what I find is even the introduction to this concept of grey or, you know, things being, well, it's not one or the other, just play with that, is, you know, sitting in discomfort, dealing with ambiguity, and we are in such an ambiguous environment now. And I would say we will be into the future more than, more than before. And so, you know, if... If it's something that a leader struggles with, it should be really high on their priority list to work through and create some comfort or some okayness around it. Yeah, and I'm, um, I've, as I said, I'm unapologetically, I've been a corporate guy for probably sort of 30 years, and particularly the last 20 years, amazing companies and businesses, um, but very set in their ways in regard to traditional, classical, you know, global, multinational sort of uh, environments. And I must when I'm starting to sort of think that is this flexibility model of a lot more external focused uh, personnel, companies, agencies, uh, consulting, contracting in and out. Is that the way that provides a freshness and a diversity of thought? And I know we talked around a little bit earlier around this uh, different thought leadership and getting ideas and things. The fact is, we do all think the same. Even when we look different, we hire people with the same thought processes. And it's a default. We talk around conscious bias and training, et cetera. We do all that. But nine times out of 10, you will do that. So how do you bring in true thought diversity and perspective and as part of your recruitment philosophy or your contracting or your outsourcing model, how do you do that on a regular basis? Um, it's the outside in perspective. Uh, it's difficult, but uh, can be, you know, I believe, can be transformational. Is that where we start to hire the worst candidate for the role? <laughs> yeah. I wonder yeah. if you played with that. Do you imagine that? But uh, always people, and I'm always sort of cautious, my supply chain directors, whenever I sort of talk around these concepts of, come on, you know, um, curiosity and willingness ahead of experience. There are some roles where, uh, no, get back in your box, Hamish. Uh, we like what you're saying. But no, we'll just uh, we want somebody who uh, knows how to run this bit of machinery. It's pretty important that uh, it doesn't break. And uh, yeah, okay, thanks. Uh, good input. <laughs> but it's an interesting theory. If you actually said, if you posed it to some someone, I actually want you to hire the person that you want to hire least, and <laughs> allow them to give reasons as to why not. And if it is, um, if if there is that willingness and the the curiosity, but it's you know, a, a difference in personality that maybe maybe that's how you override the conscious bias. It's quite nice, isn't it? I'd, I'd uh, listen, my, my very nature is I, I like the concept. I think the way it could actually work is if I go back to that 30% rule, you only do that within a part of your business. Now, Deloitte's have always had a great model that I've followed for years, the fringe to the core. So when you do a lot of uh, M&As, you are buying smaller little companies these new thought process, new technology, new segments, customers. 
and you let them, ideally, you don't incorporate and indoctrinate them your way of thinking. You let them influence back into the core. Now, you only do that for certain parts of your business. Uh, otherwise, you've got to blow the whole thing up. But I think the, the concept you just sort of talked through, um, yeah, there's probably a few areas within your portfolio, within your team, you can afford to take risks, et cetera. And if it didn't work out, it's not the end of the world. Uh, the corporation doesn't fall over, but more than likely, it'll open your mind up and think, gee, okay, maybe um, I don't do that just for the 10% of the business. Next time I do that for the 25% of the business. So uh, I, I, yeah, I hadn't thought of it, but I, I like your thinking there. Yeah, I definitely think it would work. So um, a question in relation to um, brand, you talk about um, building good leadership brand as being important. For any leader that's kind of thinking, oh, it's a, you know, I've, I've heard it, it's overused, it's, I don't really get it unless I'm looking for another role. Is my brand really important? Um, I 100% believe that brand is really important. What's your take on it? So I, um, I think I'm, I'm probably a little bit biased towards this because of uh, my supposed sort of marketing background. Um, and this concept around the best, uh, the best way to describe amazing or exceptional creative, I think, is this concept called noticed, remembered, understood. Um, and there's a lot of sort of science, science behind it, but any great piece of advertising or art or creative gets noticed in the first place. If it doesn't, well, gee, game over. Um, it has to be remembered about who it's from and actually uh, the element on that and those distinctive brand assets, consistency, et cetera. But the last point I think is the understood. They know where it is coming from. They know the context. It's not disjointed. It's uh, consistency. It's cohesive, et cetera. So I've always sort of, uh, it's interesting. I think marketeers are probably the worst people at it. They do it every single day of the year developing brands under a notice remembered understood but when it comes to your personal brand one how do you get noticed and you don't have to be a, an egocentric or an extrovert to do that and I personally I think the best leaders are the unassuming ones so it's a personal mm -hmm. um, sort of view um, but how do they get noticed in the first place what are you doing that's a little bit separate are you following the decision making hierarchy or are you actually challenging upwards etc um, and then the remembered element and understood, what's your distinctive assets that you've got? Um, are you always known as a challenger? Um, are you always known as providing incredible perspective coming in? Have you got uh, empathy within your style? Do you always follow incredible values? Are you the most professional, articulate, most um, uh, diligent person within the room? So I think when you understand those, what gives you energy and what's your talents, and then consistently actually stick to them as well. Um, and the most important thing is coming back again about being authentic. And all the feedback we get over the years, um, there's so much of it can actually overwhelm people. Listen to it, but my thoughts on it is you refine your style, you never change your style. When you start changing because of feedback and being somebody you're not, and I've done this many a times, yeah. um, Gee, it's, it's tiring, but uh, again, it just doesn't bring out the best and you have to lead almost two separate lives. Does that mm. make sense? Absolutely. Actually, it feels really easy. I think a lot of people feel like, you know, working on their brand is an additional task that they need to put focus and attention on. And what you're saying is if you just focus on being noticed, being remembered and being understood uh, and aligning that with your true authentic self, it seems easy. It seems like something that you can adopt and bring into your every day. And that's, you know, one of the things that I talk to um, a lot of leaders about is don't do more, do different. So actually just tweak your approach and, and just remember these noticed, remembered, understood principles and, and just slightly adjust what you're doing already. I agree entirely. Yeah. Okay. So I have one more question. Um, and so in your book, you say that um, bad bosses are great bosses. <laughs> and I love it. But what's that about? Well, the first thing I say is you don't want too many of them. Okay. No. Let's, uh, life can be bloody challenging enough. So uh, you don't want to have them throughout the whole time. I think, I think the, the first thing to note, uh, um, as you're well aware, 
most people and all the Gallup studies around the world have shown that most people will leave a business, not because of the business, not because of the values, the organization, et cetera. They leave it because of the line manager that they don't relate to. And fact of the matter is you're bound to have a line manager, a boss at some stage within your career and probably multiple times times where gee okay um not the greatest within that and normally when that happens you start to look around you get distracted from your learning journey um you get distracted in regard to your enjoyment and focus but you start to look as though what could be next let me get into a different department can i get a promotion elsewhere do i need to leave the business and there's facts within that in regard to a concept called negativity bias. You learn more, unfortunately, from the negative things that happen to you. They're ingrained within your memory system as opposed to the positive ones, particularly if you've got inherent dissatisfaction, you move on after a positive one, mm. which is an issue of its own right. Um, so my reflection on this is that when you get a bad boss, you learn more around what not to do than what you should do. And generally, you ingrain those behaviors and those values that go against you within your mindset so that when you lead others, when you interact and connect with others, you won't, won't repeat, those, uh, repeat those areas at all. And I've found over my time that my leadership style has equally been based on, yes, role models, aspiring to and mentors and within you know, Mars and Reebok in particular, amazing company these exceptional leaders and I've learned a lot. However, those bosses that uh, I didn't enjoy, I certainly have taken a lot from them as well. And equally, when you actually realize that and start thinking, okay, here's a learning opportunity, you start to understand that some of those bad bosses may just have blind spots. And when you have those crucial conversations with them, um, it can actually be beneficial and they may be able to turn that around. And then the other element is they've always got technical or functional mastery. So you can learn a lot from that. But I look at it as I look at it in a, uh, a learning environment, an opportunity. Um, it's difficult. You don't want them all the time, but when you've got them, uh, leverage the hell out of them. Oh, and, and that in itself is its own growth opportunity. You know, it's what's on your development plan this year. Well, just working with you. <laughs> That's it. That's all I need. <laughs> <laughs> That'll go down well, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and, and even if you didn't say it out loud, um, that if you reframed it, it it would make things awesome. a whole lot more bearable. You know, when you know that I'm I'm experiencing this discomfort and lack of enjoyment um, for the purpose of growing and developing, it makes it a whole lot easier to show up every day and be your best self regardless of, because I think sometimes a bad boss can breed, can actually damage the reputation of the people that work um, with them in their team. And just, just very quickly, I, I remember I'm just thinking of one in particular, and uh, I thought I was learning nothing at the time. Upon reflection, it's amazing how much sort of learned within that. And then there are other insights that you reflect back and like, yeah, okay, maybe they weren't as bad as I thought. And there's a context behind why they gave me that serve, why they gave me that grilling. And the context I find is actually even more important than the content. You can understand the content and generally it's black or white, but the context behind us, were they trying to sell, to sell a message? And the one in particular I'm thinking, if I said right, even if they agree that it was right, they would always say left, always and say it in an unreasonable manner, which I think was wrong, but the concept of challenging my thinking, challenging my rigor, my conviction, um, is a leadership lesson on its own right. I was just probably too young and naive uh, to actually appreciate it at the time. Saying that, I still didn't like them that much uh, on an individual <laughs> basis, but we'll keep that name separate. <laughs> it sounds a little bit like in parenting, that whole tough love con concept. <laughs> True, true. That's fabulous. Um, it's been such an awesome conversation and um, so much wisdom and insights that you shared. So thank you so much for joining me for the conversation. Lovely to connect. Thanks, Shelley. And anyone who wants to connect with Hamish, I'll put his LinkedIn um, connection uh, link in the comments. Um, and if you want a copy of the book and 
it's one you will read past chapter three. It's a really easy read. It's fun. It's light, humid. It's super relevant. And I think you've got the context right with the stories that you tell there. Um, so it's not always right to be right. I'll put the link um, where you can get a copy of um, that book as well. But thank you all for joining us. And I look forward to another dynamic leader conversation with you soon. Thanks. Thanks.